for those of you that are following the Gospel of John, uh, yesterday was an example. We had trouble with the internet link, and so it broke it up on Facebook and whatever. But anyway, whenever we have to upload the backup copy, then all you're going to do is see my face. So you won't see the scripture text on screen, and that's what happened yesterday with the John study. So anyway, just a little note there. Um, let's pray, and then we'll talk some more about the woman and the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. Father, we ask your blessing on the study of your word this morning, and we pray that you would encourage us and increase our faith, that you would um, forgive us of all the times that we get too wrapped up in the things of this world and, uh, and forget about the real, uh, our real home, and our real enemy. And so we pray that you would um, work these things out in our thinking and, and uh, that we would better serve you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, let's read the first six verses again, just for a review, since we took last week off, and, uh, and then zero in on it a little bit more. Revelation 12, 1, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. All right, then, uh, let's um, make one comment here. We talked about it some last time. Uh, in verse 4, where it talks about the dragon with his tail sweeping down a third of the stars of heaven and casting them to the earth. And you might remember that we talked about you know, there's different views of who are these, these stars of heaven, this one-third of the stars of heaven that Satan uh, apparently takes along with him in, in his rebellion in, in, in some sense. And after we looked at this last time, I found another verse here that I wanted to show you in relation to that that, that might help. It's, uh, let's see, I probably have it up here in the list. Job 38, 7, and this is where the Lord is talking to uh, Job and about his creation, the Lord's creation of the, of the world. And so like in verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it, on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, and then verse 7 here, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, it appears to me that in, in verse 7 here then, um, the morning stars and the sons of God are parallel, and as I understand it, that happens a lot in Hebrew poetry, like in the Psalms and so forth, and where it'll say one thing and then say it again in other, in other terms, but they're, they mean the equivalent thing. So here we have morning stars singing together at creation and all the sons shout, of God shouting for joy at creation. And, and so this... Uh, this would indicate that, that the stars of heaven that are cast down to the earth with 
with, with Satan, or by Satan, are, are in fact uh, angelic beings, angels. Angels who, as Jude says, kept not their first estate. And, and so, and it, it appears that that's the origin of, of demons. Yeah, so, at any rate, I think that that verse, Job 38, 7, does shed, uh, does shed some light on things. And uh, so, what are you doing, Mocha? She's, oh, she heard the neighbors. Okay, all right. Watchdog Mocha. Um, all right then, yes. So there you have a little more light shed on verse 4. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the, uh, to the earth. Also, I wanted to uh, remind you, show you once again, that this section um, really, I think, provides, sheds a lot of light on, provides some of the clearest evidence that the amillennial approach to the book of Revelation is the correct way to approach Revelation. That is, amillennial approach is the way that we've been looking at this, that, uh, that Revelation is not, not, the majority of Revelation is not looking at all of these events that are going to happen in succession right before Christ comes again, you know, a time yet future, as you know, we've talked about the futurist school of interpretation of Revelation, so that really the bulk of the book of Revelation under that interpretation doesn't have any real relevance application to uh, the the vast, vast majority of Christians down through the church history, including in, uh, in our own, that there are things that are all out there in the future. But the amillennial interpretation says, no, the majority of the book of Revelation is describing the church age. It's describing our time. Some of it can go back into the Old Testament as, as allusions and so forth. But really, the bulk of the book of Revelation is talking about events that are happening now and have been happening uh, from the time of Christ's first coming and particularly from the time of his, uh, his resurrection and ascension until, until then his, his second coming. So, um, and the reason I say that these verses uh, uh, add weight to the amillennial school of interpretation is because particularly of verses, uh, verses 5 and 6. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And there, in one verse, what you have is the entire church age. Here, obviously, she gave birth to a male child. This is the birth of Christ. You know, it's Christ because one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Um, and then his, his ascension. Her child was caught up to God and to his, his throne. So, so these events are um, happening between the birth of Christ and the ascension of Christ, which era is what we call the, then the church age. And then you also see it in verse 6, the woman who represents both the Old Testament covenant people of God and the New Testament covenant people of God. You might say um, the church, all right, in the church before Christ and after Christ. And that's a whole other issue that gets debated a lot. You know, uh, dispensationalists, uh, theologians and Bible students and preachers and so forth make a, um, they really emphasize a point that, that the church did not begin until, well, let's say the day of Pentecost. All right, in Acts chapter two, when the spirit when the spirit came, that because dispensational theology wants to keep um, the church and Israel 
completely separate. Okay, so I won't go into all that detail there. But in fact, in fact, what our approach is, is that the Church of Christ has existed from day one, from clear back in Genesis. It, it, is, the, it is the true the true people of God. And, uh, and so, but any, at any rate, you'll, you'll see this here that um, you have then, the, uh, in verse 1, a, w- a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and so on. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, and then she gives birth to this, this child, to Christ. And so the emphasis there is probably on the, the Old Covenant Church, the Old Testament uh, Israel church and and uh, but now she flees into the wilderness after the ascension of the child she flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days and now here you have the New Testament church the New Testament era once again shown to be this time times and half a time from Daniel three and a half years 1260 days 42 months and uh, all all those terms describing then the um, the same era so anyway all of that to say if you think about it some more you can look at verses five and six and see that well the book of revelation is describing this era from the birth of christ from the birth of the male child to the time the child is caught up to God and to his throne, to the, then the ascension um, of, of Christ. Um, and then, of course, we see, and we'll see more of this as well, verse 6, then uh, the woman fled into the wilderness. She has a place prepared by God. That's us. That's where we are right now, the church. And it's talking about, and we'll talk about this some more then, um, what is the experience then of Christ's true people, his true church, in this present world, which is typified here by, uh, by the wilderness. And this is something that I, don't, I think is often forgotten. It shouldn't be. But what does it mean? What is going to be our experience in this present world if we're a true Christian, if we're genuinely Christ's people, what's our experience going to be? And, of course, the word wilderness... Uh, kind of harkens us back to what the Israel's experience in the uh, in the, in the wilderness and all the, the wilderness wanderings and how God provided for them and protected them and uh, and so on. There's, there's parallels then to our our experience here, um, and I think that it is it is correct to say that. Local churches today, pastors and preachers and and Sunday school teachers and your typical church member today does not always approach that subject properly. That uh, they don't really talk about spiritual warfare and things, but but it seems like um, there's too earthy, too much uh, expectation of pleasantries in this, in this present world. But it, it's, a, it's a howling, demon-infested wilderness. And that is going to be the, the arena until Christ comes again that the church finds herself in. But she also in this has a place prepared by God for her, and is to be, and she's nourished by the Lord and protected by Him during that period of time. All right, then let's do a little bit of a general overview, some more of the dragon here. Um, John, John said it, uh, verse three. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, and I think that behold is not just kind of a a mild term. It's like a a shout, you know. It's a, this, if if you if we would actually have seen what John is seeing, this great red dragon, 
uh, it, it is a shocking um, vision that he's, that he's looking at. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven, seven diadems. So here's what Joel Beakey has to say here. Um, maybe someday we can try. I have this on screen, you know, on Kindle. If that helps to put it on there, but I won't do that today. But I think Verla said she's kind of figuring out one of the glitches there with the YOLO thing. So we might be able to go back and forth some more with the screens, but we'll keep working on that. Anyway, Joel Beakey, his commentary here on Revelation, and he has this to say about the dragon. If the woman is the church, and she is, then the dragon is the devil. Revelation 12, verse 9, and we'll see that as we get further down in this chapter, says, And the great red dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So clearly John says that this dragon is the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. This dragon is not some apocalyptic monster who will come to earth at a future date, which, which tends to be the interpretation of uh, a lot of the futurist type Bible students, Revel students of Revelation. Um, he's not some apocalyptic monster who will come to earth at a future date. He is the same serpent who deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, who now persecutes God's church, and who one day will work powerfully through the Antichrist. And uh, the, you know, the, the full um, exposure of the appearance of the Antichrist is future. It is yet to come before Christ returns again. Um, John says in 1 John that, that the spirit of the Antichrist is very active now. Many antichrists have gone out. And All right, uh, Beaky goes on. Today, many people, even some who call themselves Christians, joke about the devil. Satan, no doubt, rejoices in such foolishness, but he's no laughing matter. He wants us to forget that he is the wily one who is the sworn enemy of Christ and all who belong to him. Verse 10 says this accuser of our brethren is constantly accusing us of sin or trying to persuade us to sin. He tries to convince us that we're not Christians, thus robbing us of assurance and of faith. He's the dragon with seven crowns and ten horns who dominates the whole earth. He's at work around us everywhere, in our homes and churches, in our unconverted relatives and friends, in our schools offices and work sites, and in governments throughout the nations. We need to see what a massive foe Satan really is. He is the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and the accuser of the brethren. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians 2 to be wary of this dangerous enemy, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he is he is very, very active in the world today. So Verla and I have been watching this. Really, It's a really good series on the Discovery Channel of, uh, called The Last Alaskans. And, and it's, a really, it's a really good one. Uh, we've been enjoying it. However, as you watch it, and we actually, you know, you know we usually just watch channels like Oh, things that are on YouTube or, or a news channel or whatever, conservative news channel. But uh, we generally watch those, so we don't see hardly any advertisements. But when we started watching this series, then uh, they, they insert advertisements, and specifically they insert advertisements about... Uh, current and upcoming series that are going to be on HBO, all right? Now, and I, and now I'm talking about this because I'm giving it 
to you as an example of the uh, Satan being active in the world today. Uh, HBO is not the only channel that fits this bill, but I can tell you what, HBO is satanic. Uh, and I mean, the advertisements that they are advertising these HBO specials and series that are coming up are like total twisted, evil, perversion stuff. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I, what, I've, what I've been impressed with on that since we, we haven't, you know, we don't watch cable TV or so we haven't seen the advertisements and things, but now watching this series now, so recently here we've, we've seen some of these advertisements and it, um, it, you can just see that the world, it's growing more and more and more evil and more specifically, our own nation is growing more and more and more evil. And I mean, it's like, it is, it is Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so at any rate, all of that to say, this is, this is Satan. This is the, this is the, the devil. And, and I know people who are probably not necessarily Christians, but generally responsible uh, people and so on that, that I would respect in other ways. But they're like, oh, well, that's no big deal, you know, those series on TV. Hey, just, just don't watch it. Well, of course we're not going to watch it. But they don't seem to be all that bothered that that sort of a thing is, uh, is, is happening. So at any rate, Satan is extremely active and the, and the days are growing more and more evil, just as scripture warns us about. So, um, all right, let's see a little bit more here. Beaky has some more comments here on, in this case here, the, the, the male child that is born, who is obviously Christ. We're told in verse 5 that the woman here, representing the Old Testament church, labors until she delivers a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And again, he, he says Old Testament church because Christ was, was born a, a Jew. He's born of the seed of Abraham. And uh, so the Old Testament church. He says this, uh, this is a quote from Psalm 2, that he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm, a psalm that talks about the Messiah, that refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, the child is caught up unto God and to his throne. This then refers to Christ's life, death, and resurrection, which are summed up in his ascension. This vision focuses on the ascension because John's purpose is to show first century Christians and us that they are living in the wilderness in the post-ascension era when Christ is no longer bodily present. This is to prepare them for heaven, where they will be with Christ forever. And then with verse 5 in mind, consider verse 10. He's going to hop down ahead of us here, but we'll look at this. Here's verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brother, brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night uh, before, before God. So, and Beaky says in regard to that, as the man-child who brings salvation and strength to believers is taken up into heaven, the dragon is cast down. This is a great thing, theme of scripture. So you see this? Christ ascends, the dragon descends, rather, in, involuntarily. He's cast down. Christ is caught up, and Satan is cast down because Satan was conquered by Christ on the cross. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there with, uh, with Beaky, and then I wanted to look more specifically at these things. Uh, with G.K. Beale's help, okay? His little commentary here, G.K. Beale. So, 
Let's see what he has to say about these, these verses here. Um, I'll back up a little bit. I think we looked at some of these last time, but... Um, the, oh, just as a reminder, the picture of the dragon's tail sweeping away. I'll go back up here. Um, in verse 4, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven. Uh, the picture of the dragon's tail sweeping away a third of the stars of heaven is an allusion to the prophecy of Daniel 8, verse 10, according to which the end-time enemy of God, Satan, will throw down some of the will throw some of the stars down to earth. Now, uh, you might remember that Beale concluded that the stars uh, back in Daniel are identified in chapter 12 of Daniel with God's people. So so he's got a little bit different take on this. He says that the, the stars, the third of the stars of heaven, that is the result of, of Satan attacking, attacking God's, uh, God's people and oppressed and killed and so forth. Um, I, I kind of tend to lean toward the fact that the, the stars of heaven here in verse 4, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. Are the, are the fallen angels. And that, remember that verse I showed you back in Job 38, uh, would seem to, uh, seem to support that then. Okay, well anyway, he goes on. Now, Daniel chapter 8, which is kind of the background of, of uh, what we're seeing here in Revelation 12, uh, primarily had... Remember that historic guy that oppressed the Jews, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, and uh, about, oh, I don't know, what was it, like 150 BC, something like that. He kind of, I think, was kind of a successor of Alexander the Great. But anyway, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he's kind of a historic, Daniel points to him as kind of a historic uh, image type. Of the, of the Antichrist. Um, and so John now, as Beale is saying, John is, um, well, here's how he puts it. It comes now, Antiochus Epiphanes comes now to be applied by John in an escalated way to the devilish power that was really behind Antiochus Epiphanes and who's always behind enemies that oppress the people of God. So, in other words, it's kind of like um, Daniel gives us a more surface view. Here's Antiochus Epiphanes persecuting the people of God. And now John is like alluding to indirectly Daniel chapter 8 and what he said about Antiochus Epiphanes. But now John's taking us behind the scenes. And he's, he's telling us here that uh, the real enemy, the one that, that that devilish power that's behind Antiochus is this dragon that, that John is talking about here. Um, the primary focus is on the persecution of God's people immediately before the birth of of the of the Messiah, okay, all right. So here we go then with some new stuff. The dragon stood before before the woman, who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Okay, and that's out of verse four once again. He goes on. Beale goes on. The intention of the dragon, the second part of verse four, reveals uh, uh, that is not only to attack God's people, but to destroy the Messiah himself uh, once he was born, once the woman gives birth. Here we find a reference to all the ways in which the devil tried to tempt Jesus and to destroy him during the time of his earthly ministry. 
as Jesus' earthly lifetime is telescoped into this single phrase in verse, uh, in verse 5. Now, um, you can think of, of all, there's all kinds of, of ways in which Satan tried to destroy Christ from the time he was born. You could say he even tried to destroy Christ before he was born because he was trying to wipe out Israel, all the satanic attacks against the, the people of God. But once Christ was born, in fact, it was almost like the second he was born, right? The attacks of the devil to destroy him take place. And the, one of the first ones that comes to mind then, of course, is Herod and how he slaughtered the infants and trying to, trying to kill um, trying to you know deceive the wise men so that he could find out where the where Christ was and so that he could he could kill him. So all through Christ's lifetime, and then as as Beal mentions here, what say why was Satan tempting Christ in the wilderness? Well, he's trying to destroy him. He's trying to get him to sin, and 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 that didn't work either. All right, Beal goes on. So now a snapshot of Christ's entire life is given in one line here in verse 5. I'll roll that up a little bit here. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So uh, now a snapshot of Christ's entire life is given in one line. His birth, his destiny of kingship, and his fulfillment of that destiny by ascending to God's throne in heaven after the, uh, as he says, the post-resurrection ministry, you know, Christ appeared for a certain time after he rose from the dead. That's what Beale means by post-resurrection ministry. And then, and then he ascended. The male child who is born, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, Psalm 2, um, is, uh, is clearly here a reference to Christ. The destructive efforts of the dragon culminated in the cross, the very point where it appeared that he had succeeded in his evil plans, right? Here, you can't hardly imagine it, but here's Satan uh, just demonically rejoicing that there, we've, we've finally done it. We've destroyed the Messiah. Yet something surprising happens next. Rather than being destroyed by the dragon's attack, the child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is certainly a reference to Christ's ascension and, his, and also his, his resurrection. So, of course, the irony in this is that Satan's apparent victory over Christ by having wicked people uh, crucify Christ and put him to death turns out to be the nail in Satan's coffin, right? It turns out to be Christ's death on the cross it is the means by which Christ gained victory over, over the devil, you see, and the irony of that. All right, now Beale goes on here. The woman flees from the dragon. The woman fled into the wilderness. Here we are, verse 6. Uh, after the deliverance of her son. Consistent with the above identification in verses 1 to 2, the woman represents the community of faith I think he's, he uses these words, these phrases like this, community of faith, as kind of a, a broader term to, to mean the church of the Old Testament, the church of the New Testament, and the people of God. That's what he means by the community of faith, the genuine people of God, whether they lived in the Old Testament era or the New Testament era. Now, I, I elaborate on that because uh, nowadays, nowadays, I, I don't like this phrase, uh, the faith community, right? The faith community. Because 
that's a term that's used by, it's an all-encompassing term that's used by unbelievers, counterfeit Christians, uh, wicked people, to, to mean anybody from any religion, any philosophy, anybody who has some kind of faith, it's all okay, right? This kind of ecumenical, messy soup that you hear, that you hear all the time. So uh, a lot of times I'll get letters in the mail, you know, from some mass mailing or something, and they want to raise money for some cause, usually some social cause or something. So they're reaching out to the faith community. Well, there again, I don't like that because as soon as I see, as soon as I see that term in a letter like that, I know this is not, this is not a genuine Christian enterprise. This is not, uh, these are, these people are not, are not Christians. And, and so, you know, off into the round file, that kind of stuff goes, you see. But anyway, Beale doesn't mean that when he says community of faith here. Consistent with the above identification, verses 1 to 2, the woman represents the community of faith, though now it is not of the Old Testament era, but it is the messianic community, the church, the Messiah's people living in the age after Christ's resurrection, the New Testament church. She is now on earth and not pictured in heaven because she represents the true people of God on earth. Now, and so here, she, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. There is, as I said earlier, our experience as Christ's people, as his true church, in the New Testament era, that's our experience right there. The Satan is looking to destroy us. We're in the wilderness, but in the wilderness, God has a place, has prepared a place for us for protection and for his provision, right? So the fleeing into the wilderness alludes to the time. It has when he uses this word allude, it means has as its background. It's, it, 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 we're supposed to have it come to our mind that, oh yeah, wilderness, fleeing into the wilderness, uh, protected by God in the wilderness. Just, oh, just like Israel coming in the Exodus out of Egypt and into, into the wilderness. That's an Old Testament picture of, of the experience of the people of God now. So the fleeing into the wilderness alludes to the time when Israel fled from Egypt into the wilderness and was protected and nourished by Yahweh. The same pattern of fleeing into the wilderness is observable in the case of Elijah. Remember, after his victory on Mount Carmel, then he, he flees from Jezebel and, and kind of goes into a little bit of a woe is me, I'm the only one left type. But, it, but what happens? God provides for him there. He provides him bread and, and uh, nourishment and so forth. And he's protected then. All right. The same pattern of fleeing into the wilderness is also seen in, uh, let's see, I thought he gave some more examples here. Um, uh, Moses, right? Think of Moses. In those 40 years, yet he flees from Pharaoh, goes into the wilderness for 40 years where he's protected by God. And, uh, and then, so all of those, there's a pattern there. And it's showing us that, that we can expect the same experience, that we flee into the wilderness as the dragon trying to destroy us. And yet, in the wilderness, God has prepared a place for us to protect us and to be uh, and and to be provided for. All right. Now, now, of course, some people would say, "Well, yeah, but sometimes Christians it doesn't seem like they are protected because 
they suffer, and some of them are martyred, are, are killed. The, the ultimate protection of God, of believers, in the wilderness of this world is the protection and preservation of our faith. That, and that is, and we'll see more of that in Revelation, our faith is the means by which we are victorious over the devil. And it is that specifically that God preserves. And in other words, we'll never be, uh, our faith, our soul will never be destroyed by Satan. Can't, it, it, can't, it can't happen. Let's see what else uh, Beale has to say here. Jesus himself began to fulfill these end-time expectations, the church in the wilderness, since he was an ideal and true Israel figure. And I don't know if you've ever thought much about that, but Christ is the true Israel of God, and all who are in him are the true Israel of God. He was an ideal and true Israel symbol who before and during his ministry lived under the protection of the Spirit in the wilderness. He withstood the temptations of the wilderness to which the Old Testament Israel succumbed. In verse 6, there it is, it's on the screen there. In verse 6, the Messianic community The church is pictured as beginning to experience the end-time protection of God in the wilderness following the ascension of the Messiah. Though the community's members, that's us, experience tribulation in relation to the world, at the same time, their covenant relationship with God is spiritually protected and nourished. Now think about that because in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, that wasn't true for the vast majority of Israelites, right? They hardened their hearts against the Lord. They they tested the Lord until finally God cast them off. And there was only, what, just a handful of of genuine uh, believers then among them. But because of Christ... And because of his victory on the cross and his resurrection and ascension, that'll never happen to the new covenant community, to the New Testament church. We are in the wilderness, but we are, we are protected by God and nourished by God. He, he will, um, in Christ, we persevere. And we're not going to crash and burn like Old Testament Israel did in the wilderness. The wilderness itself does not protect, right? The world, you know, when the church flees into the wilderness, it's not because the wilderness is such a friendly place. The wilderness itself does not protect. But it is the invisible place where God's protection does occur. Even in the wilderness... The dragon's oppressive efforts to threaten and destroy the community of saints, still God protects them there. The nature of the protection is not always physical, but God guards them from spiritual deception. Because remember, many of the attacks of Satan are are lies and deceptions and And in this world, we're bombarded by those kind of things, but Christ protects us from those those attacks. Well, he doesn't protect us from the... The attacks come, but but he gives us victory over them. He gives us the ability by his Spirit to recognize the deception. Now, of course as we're learning in Pilgrim's Progress uh, that we're reading on Sunday mornings, um, if you get careless, remember a Christian falling asleep under the arbor at the hill difficulty, and what happens? He, he's careless, he, he waited there and slept too long, 
and he lost that little scroll that the shining one had given him. He lost his assurance and, uh, and ended up in trouble, and he, he had to go back and, and get it again, this kind of a thing. So, so we need to be, we can't be, we can't be careless. If we're careless, well, some of those missiles from the devil, some of those deceptions and so on, can get through and cause us all kinds of grief then. Um, in the Old Testament, remember, the desert was not only where Israel was protected from the pursuing Egyptians, but it also was an uninhabitable place of sin, evil, and judgment where only fierce animals and evil spirits dwelt. There's a picture of the world in which, in which we live. Once again, the wilderness was not a friendly place to the Israelites, but it was the place where God led them, and while they're there, he, he protected them. It was their own unbelief that was their, uh, their downfall. So, so here we are in the world. It's not this wilderness, and it's not a place in and of itself that's friendly. It's not friendly at all. It's Satan is said to be the god of this world. But but it is the place where we have the promise of God to uh, to protect and provide for us. He, Beale goes on, therefore the wilderness is the saint's place of protection, but in the midst of a hostile world. Deuteronomy 8, verses 15 to 16, sums up the dual nature of Israel's wilderness experience. Let's, I'll look at that. We're about out of time. But Deuteronomy 8, verse 15, I'll pull that up here. Um, if you want to see a, a good uh, description of, uh, of the world that we're in right now, Deuteronomy 8, I'll just, I'll start up here. Verse 11, take, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you've eaten and are full and have, oh, I'm going to scroll it up there, um, Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart, it's like, look out now, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now here it is. Who led you th through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do, to do you good in the end. And so there it is. There's the description of the wilderness. It is a great and terrifying place. It is full of fiery serpents, scorpions, and thirsty ground where there's no water. But the Lord provides that water there, and he, feed, he, he feeds with manna. And so there, that's, that's where the woman flees and is protected by God. That's the world. That's the wilderness that we, that we live in. And it's it's an enemy place, and yet it's the place where God has, has promised to, to protect us. But needless to say, uh, if that be the case, and it is, this is the nature of the world that we're living in, just consider how deceptive it is, how the world, the devil presents us with the, a world that has all these glittering things, just like he tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness has all these glittering things and money and rewards and everything if we will just follow him then instead of Christ. But here's, here's what the world really is. 
It is a great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty grounds where there's no water. It's, it's a place that is uninhabitable, un uninhabitable, really, for God's people, except the Lord has promised then to, uh, to protect us. Well, we'll continue on here um, next time. A couple more pages by Beale that I want to read. And then, and then we'll plan to get into the next section here of, uh, of chapter 12 where it talks about, this is some pretty interesting stuff. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So this is kind of a, um, you know, we have a little hint of it. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, cast them to the earth, and so on. But now, now it's like John zeroes in for a closer look at what has actually happened in regard to the devil and those that he uh, took with him in his rebellion. So we'll plan to start there next time and look at that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great encouragement. Thank you that uh, we can know what this world really is, that it's enemy territory. It is not a friendly place to your people and that we have an enemy who's raging against us and would do everything that he is doing, everything he can to destroy your people. And yet uh, you, have, you have promised your provision and your protection and, that, and we can know that, that Satan is a defeated foe and that and that when Christ comes again, he will be cast away and we'll never see or hear from him again. We thank you for all of this in Christ's name. Amen.